Personally, I find using sets of trajectories to be one of the simplest and most natural IDs in multi-object tracking. In spite of its simplicity, it's also a very powerful tool since it enables us to develop efficient tracking algorithms that conveniently overcome all the challenges that we identified for the corresponding labeled algorithms. In fact, most of the MBM and PMBM algorithms that you've learned about so far are trivial to extend to sets of trajectories, thereby enabling us to extract trajectory estimates from essentially the same algorithms that you're already familiar with. Even better, we are able to do that without changing the computational complexity in a significant manner. As an introduction to the topic, we will first discuss the problem formulation, what we mean by sets of trajectories, and try to motivate why we find it appealing on a conceptual level. A first version of our problem formulation is that we want to estimate the trajectories of all objects that have been present up until the current time. That is, the trajectories for all objects that are present now, as well as all objects that have disappeared, but that were present earlier. For instance, in the figure to the right, four objects are present at time 20, and two more objects were present earlier. According to this problem formulation, we would like to estimate all six trajectories if the current time is 20. Related to autonomous vehicles, a possible application of such algorithms is to collect estimates that may serve as ground truth for the evaluation and development of different systems. This type of ground truth data is, for instance, important to develop machine learning algorithms that are used to extract object detections from images. By the way, apart from applications related to vehicles, trajectory estimation is also important in biology, where we might want to track cells, in sport, where we might want to track different athletes, and in various other contexts. In this course, we focus on recursive estimation algorithms, where we assume that we first process the measurements at time one, then at time two, and so on. However, for some of the applications that we have in mind, it's also reasonable to consider batch processing of the data and assume that we can process all data in one go. The set of trajectory representation is also useful for those settings, but we do not discuss such algorithms here. In some applications, we really only care about the trajectories of the objects that are present right now. In the figure to the right, this would imply that we care about the trajectories of the four objects that are still present, whereas the two trajectories that ended before time 20 are grayed out and ignored. This problem formulation is important, for instance, in certain surveillance systems where we only care about the boats or people that are present right now. On the other hand, it's also easy to imagine that some surveillance systems also want information about, for instance, a person who dropped the bag at the entrance of the train station and left, which would imply that the first problem formulation is more appropriate for that system. We have previously referred to the task of computing the posterior distribution of the set of objects as target tracking. To be more precise, we actually view that as one of several possible subtasks in multi-object tracking. From now on, we will refer to that task as multi-object filtering to distinguish it from the new problem formulations. In upcoming videos, the term multi-object tracking instead refers to the specific problem of recursively estimating the trajectories of all objects, or more generally, computing the posterior distribution over these trajectories. The basic idea behind sets of trajectories is very simple. We first observe that our objective is to find the set of trajectories of all the objects. Assuming that we're taking a Bayesian approach, we would like to compute the posterior distribution over the quantities of interest. In this case, this implies that our objective is to compute the posterior distribution over the set of trajectories. By using the set of trajectories as our state variable, we obtain the posterior distribution over the set of trajectories using the conventional prediction and update steps. We can then use this posterior to answer any trajectory-related question that we might be interested in. To obtain a better idea about what a set of trajectories is, let us look at how we can parameterize our variables. In these videos, we parameterize single trajectories using a variable capital XK, where the first element beta is the time of birth. 
The second element, epsilon, is the time of the trajectory's most recent state, and I'll elaborate on what we mean by this shortly. Finally, the trajectory variable also contains the state vectors in the interval from beta to epsilon. As an example, consider a trajectory capital X4 that starts at time 2 and ends at time 4, and that takes the values 1, 1.4, and 1.8 in that interval. That trajectory is illustrated in the figure. The subindex k in capital XK means that we only describe the trajectory in the interval from time 1 to time k. If epsilon is equal to k, this means that the trajectory is still ongoing. For instance, it is possible that the trajectory in the figure to the right doesn't end at time 4, and epsilon may take a larger value in capital X5. On the other hand, if epsilon is less than k, we know that the trajectory ends at time epsilon. Given a parameterization for single trajectories, a set of trajectories is simply a set that contains a finite number of such trajectories. We use boldface capital letters to denote sets of trajectories. For instance, in the figure, we have illustrated a set capital boldface X4 that contains three trajectories. One of these trajectories starts at time one and ends at time three, whereas the other two trajectories are still present at time four. For visualization, I've used different colors and markers for the different trajectories, but that is of course not part of the set of trajectories. As you might have noticed, I use capital NK to denote the number of trajectories in the set of trajectories. If we are tracking all objects that have been present up until time k, that number is not always the same as the number of objects that are present at time k, denoted lowercase nk. For instance, in the example to the right, capital N4 is 3, whereas lowercase n4 is 2. It's important to note that the set of trajectories is a random finite set, and that we are able to leverage on many of the things that we already know about such sets, including things like the convolution formula. Let us conclude this video with some of the key arguments for using random finite sets as state variable to perform multi-object tracking. First of all, the set of trajectories is the quantity of interest. By using the set of trajectories as state variable, we obtain the posterior distribution of the quantity of interest directly from the prediction and update equations. We can of course use other algorithms to compute the posterior distribution over the set of trajectories, but those methods are beyond the scope of this course. Sets of trajectories also share many of the properties that we previously used to motivate why we wanted to use random finite sets in the first place. One such property is that there is a one-to-one -one mapping between these sets and the physical reality that we are trying to estimate. As a consequence of this, and in difference to most other representations that we could use, sets of trajectories are minimal since they avoid introducing unobservable auxiliary variables, such as an implicit label. Since there is a one-to-one -one mapping between the physical reality and the sets of trajectories, we can use sets of trajectories to develop performance metrics for trajectory estimation. This is not possible using representations that do not satisfy the one-to-one -one property mentioned above. Finally, a more pragmatic argument for using sets of trajectories is that they have been used to develop efficient and accurate tracking algorithms for both point objects and extended objects. Also, given what you've already learned, it's almost trivial to do this, and we will try to explain how this can be done in the upcoming videos.